today. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to uh, another beautiful day in the neighborhood here on top of the mountain. Oh boy. We have certainly had our share of rain and uh, I'm certainly we need it uh, somewhere. And uh, <laughs> Oh boy. But uh, it's a, a, another beautiful day here. Kind of kind of foggy, kind of hazy, but always a, a beautiful, beautiful day. We uh, want to welcome you to Jesus and Jeans Worship at the Cottage. Uh, it's our weekly ministry. Uh, my, my name is Teddy Baker, uh, along with my wife Jan and uh, Jim and Sandra Penner. We uh, coming up on four years this Easter sunrise. will be four years we've been, uh, we've been doing this. Yeah, amazing, uh, I'm telling you. But we're glad to have you, especially if you're joining us via the internet. Uh, we're, we're always honored that you take time out to be with us on Sunday mornings and. Uh, we also have our, our YouTube channel. Uh, if you haven't subscribed to that, you can go to uh, Jesus uh, space uh, apostrophe N space jeans. Jesus space apostrophe N space jeans. <laughs> it's right <laughs> Yeah, it's on the screen. <laughs> if you had, uh, our, we, we archive our messages uh, right after right after worship on Sundays, and so they're always there. Especially if you want to share them with anyone, or you want to go back and watch and something that that maybe you, you missed or you want to hear again, uh, feel free to to do that. I'm going to do a little praise and worship here. There's a couple of great old hymns this morning. my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior. The howling storms of God you hear us say, By the living word of God I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God. And I'm standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Christ the Lord, found to Him eternal me by love's strong core, overcoming daily with the Spirit's soul, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing. favorite old hymns. His 
His faithful flower I would be, for by His hand He leadeth me. Sometimes midst the of deepest gloom, sometimes weary bowers bloom. By water still, poor trouble see, still tis his hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hand he leadeth me. Since tis my God that leadeth me, He leadeth me, He leadeth me by His own hand. He leadeth me, His faithful follower I would be, for by His hand. He leadeth me, his faithful father, his faithful power I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. Powerful songs. Can't beat those old hymns. Speak the word of God. Amen. Amen. We got a lot to pray about this morning. Uh, first, we want to uh, remember Becca uh, Roby. You know, I don't know, maybe most of you heard, but this past week she went to be with the Lord and uh, uh, passed away from her struggle with cancer. And uh, so now she's free. Amen. And uh, she doesn't have to suffer with the frailties of the human condition that we all struggle with and uh, so certainly want to remember her family she's uh, has, has been um, cremated and, uh, and is being transported to Pensacola uh, to be interned with uh, her family there and uh, so certainly want to remember Becca. Um, I want to remember uh, Chuck Watkins had a procedure had a, he has a defibrillator and, and so Karen says he had to get his generator regenerated <laughs> <laughs> So I don't I don't know what that means, but uh, he's uh, he's he's recovering from that, and certainly want to keep Chuck in, in our prayers as uh, he continues to recover and get healthy. Had a, a praise report. We prayed last week uh, for Jane's uh, in-laws, uh, Bubba and Marilyn Ballard. They were in a car accident, and Marilyn was uh, life uh, transported to the hospital, and she's home now, uh, doing uh, much better. Uh, but found out that the lady that pulled out in front of him actually had a stroke while she was driving. And so she never hit the brake. She just came right out. And, uh, and so she's paralyzed uh, on one side and then her, her other side, she has every bone that's broken in her body. And so certainly want to pray for her. Uh, we don't know who she is, but God does. And uh, um, certainly want to re continue uh, praying for uh our youngest daughter, Kaylin, her mother, Carol, is uh, still struggling. And uh, uh, we have a friend, Scott Hancock, Scott and Judy Hancock, that they come to worship. And uh, Scott, this past week, he had uh, four uh, bypass surgery on, on his heart. And uh, so he went through four bypasses and came through that uh, pretty good. But it's just that recovery time is so much fun, you know, when they... Uh, uh, you, you don't want to. You don't want to be around anybody. You don't want anybody coming in there and tickling you for sure. You know. <laughs> uh, 
And I want to, Larry Mack, uh, tomorrow's going, uh, he's going to have a procedure, uh, some tests run, and so certainly want to remember him. Uh, our friends Wayne and uh, Lisa Reed, uh, Wayne sent me a, a message this morning and said they couldn't be here, but uh, wanted us to remember in prayer his cousin's 14-year-old son as they, they lay him to rest today. Uh, this, and uh, he was killed by a, a drunk driver. And, uh, and so I uh, just want to remember that family as they, uh, they go through that process. I can't even imagine um, the, uh, the hurt that they must feel losing a 14-year-old like that. So, uh, and I, I'm sure we have other prayer requests. I uh, uh, want to pray for, for Bobby for sure. Uh, the Duke Blue Devils lost. Yeah. I didn't, want to, I didn't want to bring that up, but he just had this grim look on his face like he was <laughs> just joking, just joking. Uh, oh, Lauren Kirk and uh, Greg. And uh, Jim, do we still have great report on your great grandson? And uh, he, you know, he was—he had three chances. God chose to let him live. Yay. How about that? The, he had two that were against him. Yeah. Had two that were, were very strong against him, and and one remote uh, that he may live. And God chose life. And uh, so, man, we give him praise for that. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you, God, for all that you do. We praise you for your, your majesty, for who you are, God, for no other reason than that you love us and that you are so great in our lives. We just thank you, God, that we can worship you in spirit and in truth in this place. Father, you, you've heard all of our prayer requests that we've lifted up. And, and I pray, Father, that you would once again just meet each individual where they are and minister to them in a way that only you can. We celebrate the life of Becca today. We know that she's with you. And I had opportunities to discuss her, her faith and her belief, and, and God was just convinced, uh, regardless of, of, of the human <coughs> condition that, that she faced here, Lord, uh, I know that her heart and her, her mind was, was set on you. And we rejoice in that, that uh, you've welcomed another one home today. We, we lift up all of these prayer requests again, God, and knowing that you will intervene. We, we ask your blessings today on our, our message and uh, as we continue in this series and Lord, I just pray once again that your word would be heard, that you would open the eyes of our hearts. And as we look at your word, that you would reveal to us exactly what we need to hear today as your children, that we would be encouraged and uh, empowered, able to engage with the world around us. Uh, Father, you, you've called us to serve and you've called us as your children. To, to share that witness, to share Jesus with each and every one that, that we need and use words if we have to. We love you, Lord. Thank you for loving us. We pray your blessings today in the wonderful and most powerful name, that name that is above every name, the name of Jesus. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Well, today we're going to be in the book of Matthew. And we're going to be looking at chapter 6. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Matthew chapter 6. And we're going to be looking at, at verses 25 through 34. Matthew chapter 6 is the middle chapter of what is known as the Sermon on the Mount. And this collection of teachings from Jesus begins in chapter 5 and it ends in chapter 7. It's, it's the longest and most profound teaching that Jesus or anyone else, for that matter, ever gave in the New Testament. He begins in chapter 5 with teaching about the Beatitudes. And, and the Beatitudes, they, they are attitudes that we are to be like. That's why they call them the Beatitudes. You get it? 
there are attitudes that, that we're supposed to adopt and, and, and become more like every day. He, he ends that chapter in chapter 7 with the benefits of, of building our lives on a solid foundation. And right in the middle, chapter 6, he teaches about the topic of worry. And that's where we're going to camp out today. <laughs> as we continue in this series, Building Habits of Happiness. You see, worrying is something that many of us struggle with. Well, likely all of us. We, we worry. We, we're anxious about many, many things. The state of the economy, the, the politics of our, our nation, the, the next terrorist attack. We worry about our kids or our, our grandkids and whether or not they're going to make the right decisions. We worry about job stability or relationships, our marriages, our friendships. We worry about being able to afford the next car or house repair that's needed. Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or we worry about our retirement plans or health problems that can eat through our retirement. I heard about one man, he worried so much that the hair fell out of his toupee. <laughs> That's <laughs> Another man hired someone to do all his worrying for him. He told the guy, he said, I'll pay you $200,000 a year to take care of all my worries. And the guy says, well, how are you going to pay me? He says, that's your first worry. <laughs> well, I'm my worry. That's your worry. <laughs> but if we're really honest with ourselves, we all worry, don't we? Every one of us. The ignorant worry because they don't know enough. The knowledgeable worry because they know too much. The poor worry because they don't have enough. The rich worry because they're afraid of losing what they have. The old worry because they're facing death. And the young worry because they're facing life. A couple of quotes about worrying. Blessed is the man who is too busy to worry in the daytime and too sleepy to worry at night. <laughs> a problem not worth praying about is not worth worrying about. Today is the tomorrow you worried about yesterday. Statistically, 40% of what we worry about will never happen. 30% has already happened. 12% is unfounded criticism from others. 10% is our health. And the last 8% is the actual problems that we have to do something about. That means that 92% of worry is useless. And worrying about the other 8% didn't help the situation one bit. Yet, we worry. We worry about the way we look, what other people think about us. And maybe even this morning, at the very beginning of hearing a, a message on anxiety and worry, you're already worrying about whether or not you worry too much. <laughs> but this morning, Jesus has, has some of the most straightforward and profound things to say to us about worry. And I want us to jump right in. Matthew 6, verses 25 through 34. And I'm reading from the uh, English Standard Version, the ESV, this morning. And it says this. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. <laughs> Is not life more than food? And the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. And yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you by being anxious can add a single hour to his lifespan? And why are you anxious about clothing? 
Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith. Therefore, do not be anxious saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. The message this morning is entitled Winning Over Worry. Seven reasons that I want to give you this morning, seven reasons not to worry that I've taken from these, uh, this text this morning. So let's look at the, uh, at the reasons. The first one is this. And I think that you'll like this particular one because reason number one not to worry is this. Because God says so. Because God says so. And this may seem like a given. You know, well, duh. Of course he says so. But it's really important to point out that, that three times in this passage, Jesus specifically states do not be anxious. Verse 25, verse 31, and then again in verse 34. That's why I think it's, it's worth putting this reason first. Why not worry? Because God says so. Things that we're anxious about or, or the things that we worry about are the things that end up taking way too much time out of our thought life. When you spend so much time worrying and thinking about everything that you're worrying about, it takes time away from your focus on the Father. The exact opposite of worrying is being content or being at peace. And so three times in this text, Jesus says, don't worry. He says in verse 25, he says, don't worry about your life. He's very clearly referring to anything and everything in your life. Everything about your life. <clears throat> now, I, I know when we hear, because God said so, maybe, maybe we have flashbacks to our parents or even to us as parents. You know, your, your parents would always say, go brush your teeth. Why? Because I said so. <laughs> but God is completely different. God has very practical reasons for us, us to obey Him. Especially when it comes to worry. He knows the effects of worry. He knows the impact of worry on our lives. But more importantly, we're out to, we're, we are to obey God not just because he said so, but simply because he is God. When Jesus says, don't be anxious, it is different than just a mere human telling us to do that. I mean, I wish I had a dollar for every time someone has said those words to me. I don't worry about it. How about you guys? Did it work? No. Yeah, probably not. Because they're easy words to say, but they're hard to put into practice. And besides, coming from just a, another human being, even if it's someone that's very close to you, like a friend or your spouse or, or whatever the case, it, it seldom brings about a, a positive return on the investment. 
Why? We still worry. Yeah, I hear you. But we still worry. But when it comes from God, it means so much more. When God says, do not be anxious, he says it as the only one in the universe who is all sovereign, all knowing, all powerful, all good, absolutely unchanging, and infinitely powerful. The nature of our great God causes worrying to really make no sense whatsoever if we're truly trusting in Him. And so the first reason not to worry is because God says so. And why is that fitting? Because He's God. The second reason not to worry is that our lives are too important. Do you ever look at yourself that way? Our lives are too important. Verse 25, Jesus said, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body. What, what you will put on <laughs> is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Jesus brings up three things specifically not to worry about. And those things are what we eat, what we drink, and the clothing we wear. And he uses these three basic needs as, as representative of all the things that we worry about in life. It's, it's not just about those few things. It's about everything in our lives. Now, I want you to think just for a moment about what worries you the most. Now, now think about it. Just, just think about it for a moment. You see, we would never say that these things that we worry about matter more to us than life itself. We'd never say that, would we? We'd never say that, but sometimes, sometimes we act as if that's exactly the case. Our minds are stuck on these things that are uncertain. And sometimes they get so stuck, in fact, that we forget what really matters most. Is not life more important than food, Jesus asked, and the body more important than clothing? And Jesus is saying that if God provided you with life itself, and these very attractive earth suits that we walk around in. <laughs> these bodies that we, we, we live in and carry us, carries our spirit around in. Can he not be trusted to take care of all those other things that we worry about? It is precisely because God provides the far more important things like life and the body that he can be trusted to provide food and clothing and every other need that we have. Don't worry because your life is too important to worry. And God is the one who has provided you, each one of us, with that life, that body. The third reason not to worry is very similar to the second one. The third reason not to worry is that our lives are too valuable. Our lives are too valuable. For this one, Jesus uses two specific examples that are so simple for us and easy to remember. In, in verse 26, he says, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And then in verses 28 and through 30, he uses this other example. He says, why are you anxious about clothing? Evidently, you know, they were, they were worried about all the clothing they were. They're, they're fashion models back then. Not much has changed today, has it? 
He said, why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? The thrust of what Jesus is saying here is, is that we're more valuable than birds and yet our Heavenly Father takes care of them. He feeds the birds. We're far more valuable than flowers, but even Solomon with all of his money and his glamour and his power was not clothed as magnificently as a simple flower in the field. When Jesus is saying, come on guys, this, this is a faith issue. These are, are, these are just flowers and grass and yet the Father takes care of them. The flowers and the grass, they don't last long, especially grass. Because grass in the first century was very commonly used for fuel. Which was probably why he was referring to when he talks about the grasses alive today but then it's being thrown into the oven because it was used as fuel to fuel their fires and the point is that we are of far more value than either of those things we we sometimes forget who we are we, we forget that we are the pinnacle of God's creation we're, we're not down here on the food chain we're up here. We're the pinnacle of God's creation. We're made in His image. We, we are created in His image like no other creature on this earth. What a wonderful thing to do when you walk outside and observe the beauty of His handiwork in this place. When every time I come here and stand and just look around at, at his handiwork, the beauty of, of these mountains in North Georgia, I want to challenge you. This morning as you leave, before you yank out the cell phone, you start checking all your stuff, <laughs> Before you yank that cell phone out, I want you to take a moment when you walk outside and just look at what God has created. And as you do that, realize that even as beautiful, as majestic as God's creation is, you are the pinnacle of His creation. Think of yourself that way. You're the very best at what he's created. You are the most important, the most valuable part of his creation. And if God takes care of everything that we can see, if he takes care of all of that stuff out there, then you can know that he will take care of you as well. The fourth reason not to worry is that worrying achieves nothing. Look at verse 27. And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? There's an old saying that says, worry is like a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but it doesn't get you anywhere. <laughs> There's a lot of truth to that, isn't it? Is that an amen or an oh my? Yeah. <laughs> Probably a little of both. Oh, yeah, it's like a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but it doesn't get you anywhere. And then this verse, Jesus is asking a, 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 a rhetorical question. And he's making a point, a really important one. And, and this gang might be the most practical fuel for getting rid of anxiety. 
And it's by asking this question. How does worry, how does worrying about anything make anything any better? It doesn't. Worrying in and of itself does nothing to help us. The other side of the coin is that Jesus isn't, he isn't telling us not to, to be concerned, not to have concerns. He isn't saying as Christians that we should just be like careless, you know, completely carefree, you know. <laughs> wow, it's like nothing really matters, man, you know, because you know, hey. You see, many of the things that you and I worry about are legitimate things. They have a legitimacy. They're, they're more than legitimate. They matter incredibly. Here's, here's the key. There's a great difference between worry and concern. A worried person sees a problem. And the concerned person solves a problem. Big difference between that. The worried person sees the problem. The concerned person solves a problem. In leadership, I was always, you know, I, I, I knew what the problems were. Unless it was just something that was truly escaping me. But my first question is, okay, what's the solution? What is the solution to this problem? We're not just going to sit here and worry about the problem. We have to have a solution for every problem. You see, every year, from June through November, I'm concerned for our youngest daughter, Kaylin, and our, our youngest grandson, Trace. Why? Because it's hurricane season in Charleston, South Carolina, where they live. And so I get very concerned every time a storm is named on the East Coast. And I immediately go into the solution problem. Okay, we're going we're to get them here, and we're going to get the, you know, God, okay, what are you going to do? Where are you going to go? And, what's gonna, you know. and we start worrying about that. But if I'm not careful, anxiety in me begins to build because of that. Because it's one of those things you have no control over. Exactly. And, and so if anxiety starts to build in me, man, I, I, I can take that thing to a, a level that, that really becomes unhealthy for me. Because being anxious for long periods can cause other underlying health risks. Long-term anxiety and panic attacks can cause your brain to, to release stress hormones on a regular basis. And this in, can increase the, the frequency of symptoms such as headaches or dizziness, even depression. When you feel anxious and stressed, your brain floods your central nervous system with hormones and chemicals designed to, to help you respond to a threat. Like adrenaline and cortisol. Two examples of that. And, and one study even revealed that even low levels of anxiety are tied to an increased risk of death. Which is just a more pointed way of saying that worry can shorten your life. Not only does it not add the slightest bit of time to your life, but it also can shorten it. Worrying achieves nothing, at least nothing worth achieving. The fifth reason not to worry. Worrying is for non-Christians. Yeah, let them worry about it. Worrying is for non-Christians. Verse 31 and 32, Jesus said this, Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all those things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. And when you hear the word Gentile used in this sense, 
That word at that point was a term referring, uh, referring to men and women that did not know God. They didn't have God in their life. They had no faith in God. If you remember, that, that was the purpose of Paul the Apostle. And when Jesus anointed Paul and brought him into being, he was the one that was going to carry the gospel message to the Gentiles. And so the Gentiles were unbelievers. And so for those outside the faith, it makes sense that they worry because they don't know the Heavenly Father as we know Him. It makes sense that they have a, a natural, materialistic worldview about everything. And truth is, they have a lot to worry about. But we know Jesus. And because of Jesus, we know this heavenly Father that, as I mentioned early, earlier, knows all things and is sovereign over all things. And our Father knows of every single thing that we need. But here, here's the problem. Sometimes we talk like believers, but then we worry like pagans. We, we say we believe in this great God that we call our Heavenly Father, but then we act as if our lives are in our hands and not His. And here, here's the truth. The more we get to know the Father as He really is, the more we read His Word, the more we will see Him, not as a man in, in whom we, we, we place our hope and we, we cross our fingers that He pulls us through, but as our loving, heavenly Father whose character is so perfectly consistent that he literally cannot break a promise that he's made. That's why Jesus said, leave all that worry stuff, leave all that to the unbelievers. We are people of faith. We are God's children. We are his beloved. The sixth reason not to worry. Worry is just a distraction. Verse 33. Verse 33 is the climax of this passage. And it's the main point. Because up to now, Jesus has been giving us what they call the negative command. He says, don't worry. Do not be anxious. But now he gives us what is called the imperative active command. In verse 33 he says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, <clears throat> and all these things will be added to you. Seek first. Remember what I tell you about an imperative statement in the Bible? That anytime you see, seek first the kingdom of God, Put your name in front of that. But Teddy, you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. But you, Leonard, seek first the kingdom of God. You, Rod, you, Kathy, you, Glenn, you, Sherry, Karen, you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. I'll tell you, gang, this is a great verse, a great one to memorize and to hide in your heart. Really, this whole passage is a great one just to dwell on and read every now and then, especially when you worry. As Christians, as God's children, we are to seek first 
the kingdom of God before you worry. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And, and so what do you think that Jesus is trying to communicate to us by saying that? This is what I believe he's saying. This is Teddy's interpretation. This is the T.I. version. <clears throat> I believe that he's saying that our minds and our hearts are to be so set on submitting to kingdom life that we don't have time or the energy to worry. You see, when you make yourself the object of everything that's going on in your life, you worry about everything. Well, I'm, I told Janice, well, I'm, I'm gaining weight. I'm not losing weight. I'm gaining weight. And so when we focus on ourselves, we take the focus off of God and we take the fo focus off of other people that we can allow God to use us to be a witness to them, to help them, to love them. You know, when I'm doing things for other people, it makes all my stuff look very small. And so he's saying that we should be so set, our hearts and our minds so set on submitting to kingdom life. We have one purpose in this life and God is saying that when we focus on that one purpose, which is His kingdom and His glory working in and through our lives, Jesus said God will take care of the rest when you do that. When you're looking at the world, say, God, where are you working out here? Because I want to join you there. I, I was playing up at 12 Spies Vineyard yesterday, and thank God it was cold and rainy and wet, you know, and, and so they let me play in the tasting room. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't ever get to play in the tasting room because they have this huge deck that's outside. So I always play out on the deck. But today I'm in the tasting room. <laughs> and there was a guy that showed up there. And he was joking with Mike Brown, the owner. And he kept joking. And, and so I was taking a break and walking around. And he came over to me and he says, I hear you're a minister. I said, yeah, that's right. He said, well, I'm not a very God-fearing person at all. I went, really? That's interesting. Do you want to know God? Well, I don't know. I just don't I have I don't believe all that stuff. Okay. Well you want me to do that. <laughs> you think I'm gonna just go, hey, boom, you know, hey, all right, now oh, there you go, you're a believer. I said, let me tell you something. Here here's some some books to read. Here's some things that I challenge you to do. Because my first thing to say to somebody is that you can't just come tell me that I just don't believe all that stuff. Well, that's a fair statement until you tell me why you don't believe. Have you done the research? Beyond a shadow of a doubt, spent hundreds of thousands of dollars like many others that I'm telling you to go read who were absolute atheists. And so when you go and read all the information and do the research, here's my card. You call me anytime, day or night. We doze, but never close. <laughs> you call me anytime that you have any questions about walking with the Lord. And I promise you, if you'll do the research, God will begin a work in your life that can change you because it changed me. That's good. Awesome. And so he took my card. And so I said, well, I got to go back and play something. So it's been nice talking to you. <laughs> and I'm walking back over to sit down and I'm going, Lord, I, I didn't see this guy coming. Stay with Scott. Pray for Scott. I didn't see Scott coming. 
I didn't know he was going to show up today. I wasn't even looking for him. I wasn't even looking for you. I'm here working. <laughs> but you brought him into my life. Thank you, Lord. God, man, it, it just made my day that I could share Christ with someone in my own way. And I knew that God had me there for a different purpose. Because I didn't think I was, I knew I wasn't going to play out on the deck. It was too cold. I was cold. <laughs> but he let me play on the inside. And he brought me Scott. Man, when you look and see where God's working, when you do that intentionally, God will bring people into your life. He'll bring situations into, into your life. And he uses you to connect with someone else that they might see Jesus in you. Hmm. We have one purpose, is, is sharing the love of Jesus. In verse 25, back at the beginning of our text, it says, therefore, do not be anxious about your life. What have I taught you in the past about the word therefore? When you see the word therefore in scriptures, you're supposed to ask the question, what is it there for? <laughs> and in this case, it's referring to the verses right before it. In the verses right before, Jesus is speaking of having only one treasure, one vision, and ultimately one master. And that's what he's talking about. And, and when you make decisions that ref reflect this reality, I live for the audience of one. Mm. I'm not worried about what other people are doing. I live for the audience of one. And when you do that, you have no reason to worry. And that's why he says, therefore, do not worry. Because when you're focused on one vision, one treasure, one master, Jesus... There's nothing to worry about. And in a very real sense, if you're not following Christ right now, you do have things to worry about. You're probably more worried than most of us. I know Scott was. He was worried, but he didn't know how to believe. He couldn't get past his own pride. He couldn't get past his own opinion. That's why I said, you need to do some research. And I challenge you to do it. Don't just say, I don't believe. That's a cop-out. Do the research. Then call me. They probably have more to worry about than any one of us ever will. But if here's the truth. If, if we will accept Him into our lives and truly follow Him, you'll have no reason to worry whatsoever because you're in God's hands. And you're in the path that He wants you to be in. The seventh reason not to worry, and this might be my favorite, is that today, today is enough. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. In other words, God has appointed to each day its portion of pleasure and trouble. And as your days are, so shall your strength be. So don't misappropriate God's allotted troubles for tomorrow. Don't carry that stuff over in tomorrow. You got enough for today. Don't bring them forward into today from yesterday in the form of anxiety. Believe that God will still be God tomorrow. <laughs> he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the main point of all this is <clears throat> that it is clear and it's unmistakable that Jesus does not want his followers to be anxious. He doesn't secure his kingdom 
by keeping his subjects in a state of worry. He's not lording over you to say, well, if you don't do this, and if you don't do that, and you got something to worry about, buddy. He never does that. On the contrary, according to verse 33, the more primary, the more central his kingship becomes in our lives, the less anxiety that we will have. You see, Jesus came. He came and He lived and He died and He rose from the dead in order that He might reign as King over anxiety-free people. So come to Jesus. Forsake all other allegiances. Take your vow of loyalty to the King of kings and seek first in all you do to make known His kingship over your life. It's your pathway to freedom from worry and anxiety. I want to conclude with this story. The late pastor and uh, professor, very renowned pastor and professor David Buttrick told the story of a baby who clapped her hands over most anything. Shove breakfast cereal in front of her. You'll get a hand clap. Sit her in a circle of toys and she'll break into applause. And her parents took her to the seashore to watch the waves roll in and she started clapping right away. Are the baby's parents concerned? The parents said, we only worry, they say, that someday she'll stop. You see, too many of us have exchanged that kind of extravagant wonder for excessive worry. And as a result, we've stopped clapping. We've stopped celebrating God's goodness, His gifts, His creative powers that He gives to each one of us. And most of all, His unconditional love. You know, since we're at the beginning of Lent, worry would be a great choice for something to give up this Easter season, wouldn't it? And don't take it back. Let it go. I don't know what worries you today, but when it comes to winning over worry, I've given you seven reasons why not to worry. Whatever it is that you're worried about, you can know this morning that beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is aware. In fact, He's more than aware. He's actively caring for you in the midst of these worries as only your heavenly Father can do. Now that's something to clap about. Amen. 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 Give Him praise. We praise You, Lord. Thank You, Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you, God, that you are in the midst. You're always working in our lives. We pray for Scott this morning. God, I thank you so much that you had the opportunity, the mindset to bring him in to where I was working, and you gave me that opportunity. We pray, Lord, that he would do the research and come to know you in a very powerful way. Lord, you did it for me. <laughs> you could do it for anybody. We give you praise, God, that you are con and continually work in this room and in the lives of the people who come and show up. And God, I'm just always amazed. I never take it for granted at your power working in and through our lives. Help us to take ownership of that and to do away with the worry that just wears us out. We'll be quick to give you all the praise and the glory. The Lord bless you and keep you. 
The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face towards you and give you peace. And all God's children said, Amen. 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 God bless y'all.